Hi guys, and welcome to part two of our semantics and entity recognition lectures. So in this lecture, we're gonna cover named entity recognition, part one. And we're breaking this into two parts to, to keep it from being way too long. So first let's start with what is NER? And so a named entity is a real world object with a proper name. So things like Apple, Google, that are often used as other words, Apple a noun or Google a verb, but are also company names. So these are proper nouns that we think we've been tagging for part of speech tagging. And so this is why part of speech tagging is so critically important for named entity recognition, because you have to know that the thing is a noun. So things like Twitter, France, any celebrity you're interested in, and things that you wouldn't think of, like dates. So maybe we could talk about geopolitical entities, things like countries or regions of the world. Think about persons like celebrities or, um, or politicians, organizations like Twitter, and more. So how many categories can there be? Well, there are many different ways to do this, but the one that Spacey uses so that we're going to look at is about 18. So in part of speech tagging, we had a lot of different categories. So we could use the brown corpus, which has 54 or more categories. We could use the universal part of speech system, which only has 10. So same issue um, happens here where we can um, determine the level of specificity that we're interested in. Okay. And it's really up to us to determine that level of granularity in those tags. So here are some of the most common tags that people use in NER. PER for person, LOC for location, org for organization, MIS for miscellaneous, more, um, NORP for nationalities, religious, and political groups, like Democrats or um, Catholic Church. Okay. Facility for buildings, airports, and highways, because they technically have names. GPE for country, or geopolitical entity, product for things like objects or foods or any kind of um, product listing, event for things like hurricanes, battles, wars, and sporting events, which seems like a very strange category, but any kind of event that has a date and time, okay. work of art for songs, books, and paintings, law for named laws, language for languages, and then there are many number categories. So date, time, percent, money, quantity, ordinal and cardinal. Okay, ordinal first, second, third, fourth, cardinal one, two, three, four. Okay. So we could use quite a bit of, quite a few of these. So Spacey as a default for the English language module has 18 different tags that we can use. Okay. So why would you use NER? Well, Often people are interested in tracking sentiment for these companies, or if you're interested in stocks and looking at how reporting on stocks, or right now you might be really interested in Bitcoin. So finding those in the text allows you to then do other things. So entity linking is where we use NER to help us find the relationships between things in a text. And we really compare NER with dependency parsing that we'll cover in the next couple of weeks of lectures to create systems that can not only um, tag the entities, but also show you how they're related to other things in a sentence. Okay. So let's say I have Rome as the capital of Italy. I really need to know that Rome and Italy are both tagged as geopolitical entities, more like Rome would be a location and Italy would get tagged as the geopolitical entity because it's a country. And we can link them together, like the city and country are in the same sentence, so maybe they're linked together. Okay. A business might use this ability to help them identify links between organizations because they're both listed in the same text. And one of the main rules is that words that hang out together are friends, so if they appear in the same document, they often have a relationship to each other. However, one of the biggest problems with these types of NER systems is that they are considered very brittle, breakable. So part of speech systems are very generalizable. 
as long as you're using similar parts of speech and you're not moving from, let's say, the Brown corpus to Twitter, which is very different, in general, in general, it will extend to new texts. Okay. Even when we worked on our Harry Potter examples, going from the Brown corpus to Harry Potter tends to work pretty well, minus the specific, specific words that are uh, only found in the Harry Potter texts. Right. So in in normal times, things like part of speech tagging are very generalizable. Going from one type of text to another, you get this, you get good results. Okay. NER, not so much. So the training is very specific to the task. Um, and there are databases for uh, NER training that one can use. Um, but this is a system that's always changing. So new celebrities appear, new songwriters, um, new hurricanes, unfortunately, I live in the hurricane area, <laughs> and you would have to be constantly updating your model. Now, if you're only interested in, um, you know, the top 500 stock companies, those probably aren't going to change very often, but that training is very specific to that task. Okay. So while part of speech tagging is consistent across text, it, as long as it's a well-trained model, NER taggers are not. They are generally trained to recognize specific contexts. And as long as your text is similar, it will work, but don't hold your breath. Okay. And so most people who use these sorts of systems have are either constantly updating their model or they're very specific um, instances that they're looking for. So we're going to look at how to train these models, but in theory, NER is just a complex machine learning task. So you can do anything we did in the previous lecture, um, but instead of using part of speech tags, use NER tags. You could use many different types of machine learning, but we're going to focus on how to do this in Spacey. Okay. The way that Spacey does this in Spacey 2 because I cannot figure out Spacey 3 for the life of me just yet. Um, the way that Spacey 2 does this, it, it, the difficult part is putting it together in the proper format. Okay. So we'll do that in the next lecture. Okay. So instead of having a data set tagged with part of speech, we'll use data sets that are tagged with entities. We'll actually create a very small one of our own. And we'll talk about how difficult this might be to scale. Um, but do know that there are corpora that you can use to, to train. Um, but if we didn't have a corpus already, how could, what could we use? What could we leverage that we already do have? Okay. Well, we could just create a dictionary of all of the people and places you're interested in finding. So if you aren't interested in the latest celebrity gossip, you might consider excluding those types of tags. You know, if you're only interested in stocks, it's going to be a very pretty easy data set to create. And so that's why these systems are, are usually company specific is because there's a specific type of thing that you're looking for. Okay. Um, there are probably instances where you want to kind of tag everything, but that would take a lot of time and effort. And so it's more likely that you're going to pick something that is related to your task. And so any type of dictionary that we create is going to be limited um, because it either is going to be super big if we're doing everything, or it's going to need constant updating. So things that um, that come arise and are new will take you a while to, to add into the system. Okay. Trending objects will be difficult to capture. So what other things might we use? Well, we could look for words around a target word. My company <laughs> would be a really popular word to look for if you're looking for a specific type of company. Singer, musician. So if you look for the, the labels of the types of things you're trying to tag, okay, most hurricanes are labeled hurricane name. So it would be easier to find. We could look for prefixes or suffixes on those words. Okay, and that would be easier for numbers. And or I'm trying to think. Um, city, right? So some names are going to be specific, but I would think special symbols or capitalization would be easier to find. So all of these things are small features that are embedded in text that might help us find the data we're looking for. 
when we maybe necessarily don't have a specific list of objects that we're looking for. Okay. So this might be a first stage that you use to figure out the list of objects that you're looking for. And then a second stage might be to, to find those objects in text and work on training them. So once we figure out those features, we want to use the category our category categorize our named entities. The task becomes then a machine learning task. Okay. Um, a popular algorithm for NER is conditional random fields, and then a lot of deep learning. Spacey is somewhere in the middle. It's somewhere between a, a simple and deep learning neural net type model and um, works pretty well. I would say that the biggest complaint I have is the difficulty in getting it in the proper format. That's true for Spacey 2, and that's my problem with Spacey 3, which came out recently-ish, and I've been trying to use it, but none of their examples work. So we're going to talk about Spacey 2 because I can tell you exactly how to do that one. Still difficult to get it in the right format. Okay. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about a very classic system of NER tagging. This sometimes is called chunking. So if you're looking at the old NLTK text, this is the whole section is called chunking. The newer name for this is entity recognition because you would be chunking things that are entities. Uh, but chunking can also work for, for making phrases. Right? And so a popular way to do this is called IOB tagging. So IOB tagging creates boundaries in a text that help us find specific chunks. Okay, so IOB tagging stands for the um, word boundary, so beginning of a chunk, the inside of a chunk, right, and then the outside of a chunk. So anything tagged with O are words or pieces of the sentence we might not be interested in, whereas things tagged with a B and an I would be things that we are interested in. And so we tag all of our words or our tokens in a text with these three labels and then use it to sort them out. So pull out all the B and I's in a sentence. Okay. And so it's very popular. It's, you'll see it in text where people describe this tag type of tagging, um, but mostly now people use um, systems that just simply find the start and the end of a piece of text. So they live labeled by character or by token count rather than tagging every single word. And traditionally you needed all three of these. You couldn't just use B and I because you wanted to tag every token with something. So it was a way to create a complete data set that every, every token had a tag, just like every token gets a part of speech, every token gets a chunk tag. So it's either in the chunk, an entity I'm interested in, or it's outside the chunk. So another word I'm not interested in, like of. Okay. All right. So the I tag is also is necessary. I'm just making an argument here that every, every word has to have a tag. Okay. Spacey actually will do this system. We're not, gonna, we're not gonna use it, but it does actually do this in the background, but it also uses uh, L and U. So B for beginning, I for inside, L for last. So it, it makes it more clear if, if a chunk, uh, the entity is an entire phrase. So, um, the War of 1812, for example, is an entire phrase that is a chunk, that is a, a specific um, event tag, right? And so you would get War of 1812 as beginning, inside, and last to know that that whole thing is one big entity. U for unit, a single entity token. So we would classify all those together. And then O for non-entity token. Okay, so you would be used when you're tagging things like Apple, because that's it, right? It's a one word token. And that whole system together allows us to create these chunks, like this entity is a three word chunk. And I've said before, you would ignore the word of, but in this case, we wouldn't ignore the word of because it's part of the label for that entity. And so one of very famous system before we jump here into Spacey is the Stanford named entity recognition tagger. I don't tend to show this to people because it runs on Java. And I think I've made it clear from the beginning of the semester how much I hate Java. And it can be a difficult thing to set up and um, to make work. So we're gonna use Python um, for this task. I haven't seen a whole lot of this in R, uh, but it is a very famous NER tagger. It's one of the originals. 
it's available to use in NLTK, but you still have to make Java work. Okay. And so the setup requires finding these Java files and getting it set up correctly. And it's just, eh, it sucks. <laughs> um, but it is a one of the originals and as a conditional random field algorithm that uses pattern recognition, so regular expressions, to help learn the patterns in a text and then tag the patterns in a text. Okay. So we're going to stop here and um, make this very short. Uh, I thought that would take longer and then talk about Spacey in the next video. All right. In this last section, what we're going to cover is how to analyze named entity recognition with Spacey. So we'll start with the simple part, doing it yourself in their predetermined system, and then building it yourself. So if you want to use Spacey's pre-built English model, for example, you need to import Spacey and load the English model that you downloaded, or whichever language you're interested in. So we're using the small model because it is the easiest one to work with. And we do spacey.load and we loaded it as NLP. And so we put in two sentences here, one that includes a former president and a country, and then another that includes university names. So let's see how we can automatically grab the entities from this. And so one thing I want you to notice is how it tags the names and places. Now it does do the BILOU system in the background, but we're not printing that out. And also notice here, when we only print out the entity types, there are going to be blanks. So what we've done is for each token, in our first example, we printed the token.text, that just gives us the token back, and the token.int type for the entity. It has tagged Donald Trump as a person in France, as a geopolitical entity, and today is a date. So today might be one that surprised you. If we look at the longer sentence example, we've got org for this university, right? Master of Public Affairs at Sciences Po as a facility as part of the university. So, you know, that's actually the degree name probably, but may also be the building. And a graduate from, uh, the National School of Administration in French here. So it, maybe if we considered this a, a important name, so like an organization, then we missed this. Okay. In 2004, we got the date. Okay. So it kind of depends on what you want it tagged here. So we've got the university name, but maybe we missed this ENA. But default-wise, it does do pretty good. Let's say you have a specific set of data you're interested in working with though, and instead you want to create your own tagger. Because we've already talked about how these taggers can be fairly brittle and maybe you want a system that you design on your own. So don't forget this is for Spacey 2.2.3 and lower. Okay. I think 2.2. up is still fairly similar, but when you move to Spacey 3, it's very different. So to train models in Spacey in the specific formula, format, um, you start with a blank model in a specific language. So we have built spacey.blank in English. Next, you add some information to the type of model you want to build. So I'm adding um, example model training. And this tutorial is taken from uh, Entity Extraction with Spacey and their usage training, but for the previous version. So spacing models are built on pipes, thinking about data science pipelines. So the first thing we'll do is add an NER pipe. So our NLP here is our new blank model, dot create pipe, and we put in NER. Okay. Now to our NER, we are adding the NER pipe. Okay, so we created a, a model now that has this NER pipe as opposed to being blank. And to that, any uh, NLP model, we're adding this NER pipe. This is a little strange because you first create the pipe and then you add it back to the original model, but that's how it was programmed. So create the pipe, add it back to the model. Now let's create some type of training data. 
And here's a very small example. With the warning here that this is a list of tuples that contain dictionaries. So it's the three main types of Python objects that one can have. And this is where you're gonna make a mistake. And so I recommend cutting and pasting this kind of half JSON format that's going on and editing. But usually you'll be missing a close, like a close for the tuple or a close for the, the dictionary. And so I'd recommend um, keeping these comments in here so you can keep things closed when they're supposed to be. Sometimes also people miss commas. Okay. This is the easiest place to make the mistake. So let's break this down. This is two examples, which obviously is not a very good training data set, but fits on one slide. And we're gonna work through what each, what is required to be in a training set in this form of Spacey, all right? So what you have to have is a list. Okay, so we have the list and the end of the list. Everything within that is a set of tuples. Okay, so we have a list of tuples. Here's an example of one tuple. Here's an example of a second tuple. Each tuple is considered an instance that you're training your model with. Okay. So you have a list of tuples that are used for training. Within those tuples is a dictionary. Okay. So the first piece of the tuple is Unicode, the U here indicates Unicode, of the text example you would like to give. So it always starts with an example text piece. Okay. I would argue that this would be easier in sentences. So if you have a really long dictionary piece of text I and you're formatting this yourself, I think it would be easiest to break this down sentence by sentence. Okay. Now, you have your sentence here and it's the name of a book. Okay. Search analytics, business value and big data, no SQL backend. Um, by Otis Gospodnetic. Gospodnetic. <laughs> so what might we be interested in? Maybe just the name of the person, maybe the name of the book. And then this is, you get to choose because we're training our own data. There, there are no rules here. You just have to train your own data. So the first piece of the tuple is always the text you're interested in. Now it's good to keep it short because the next piece of the tuple is a dictionary. Okay. The first part of the dictionary always says entities or this will not work because otherwise it cannot match your NER pipeline to the dictionary entity piece. Because you can train multiple pipes at once. So you, I could also train part of speech pipes or dependency pipes. However, we're gonna separate those things out because doing them, um, many at a time might be confusing if you've never seen this system. So we're gonna start here by just doing entities. So your tuples could have um, the text, a dictionary for entity, in, a dictionary entry for entities, a dictionary entity, entry, <laughs> a dictionary for entities, another piece for part of speech and another piece for dependencies. And so you'd stack them all together. Right now, what we're gonna do is focus on just the entities, right? So text, then our dictionary. Okay, so here's the dictionary. I remember that dictionaries are key value pairs. And so the key here is always entities. Do not change the word entities here. Do not misspell the word entities and do not copy from that place on Course Hero where that person has misspelled entities because then it's real obvious where you're copying from. <laughs> Okay. So entities, make sure it's spelled correctly. Okay. And then the value, excuse me. So the key is entities, the value is a list. So it's a tuple with a dictionary with a list. And that list is a list of tuples that has the start character, the end character, and then what type of tag it is. And so this is a really good spot here for regular expressions. If you have a list of objects that you're interested in finding in your personalized entity tagger, 
you could search through the text to find those objects and then train it by putting in the start and end blocks. So remember, re.search will find the first instance anyway um, and tell you the start and end tags. So you would search through each one and find the piece you're interested in and add the start and end dates, start and end characters rather, and the tag itself. Hey, this is not broken down by token, it is broken down by character. And that's because it generally is looking for um, chunks of text. So remember the named entity recognition is actually mostly considered a chunker. It's finding chunks of text that are interesting. And so it has you break it down by character rather than by token. So the start token, uh, start character, the end character, and what type of tag you want. Now this tag could be anything. It does not matter if they match the system that is already there for Spacey, you could make up your own here. Okay, so you could tag the name of the book as tech if you wanted. Okay, so we've only tagged one thing in this sentence. If you wanted to tag more things, you would put a comma right here and add another tuple. Okay, and so here's an example where it has more than one thing tagged in the sentence. So here's the name of a book. Introduction to Elastic Search. It's got the name of the book tagged from, uh, or the, the name of the piece of technology, Elastic Search, from character 16 here to 29 as tech. The person's name here, 33 to 37, as person. Also, don't forget Python is a zero index language. Okay, so don't tag the wrong spot. So one more time, it's a list okay, that is a list of tuples. The tuples are um, pairs of objects. So the first, well, it's more than that, but the tuples are the text and then the dictionary, okay, and then the text and the dictionary. In the dictionary, it's entities as a list of tuples and where those entities are. Okay. And so this is what I really wanted to highlight as why I find this sort of training very difficult because this is complicated. <laughs> I, it's a list of tuples of dictionaries that are formatted as tuple lists. It's, it's very nested, very structured data. And so if I were making my own training data set um, from a large body of text, I would probably tokenize by sentences. And then within those sentences, find the objects that I was looking for and tell it to put it in this format, like write it text-wise out in this format by plugging in the, the regular expression finder for first character, last character piece, right? And then use some text wrangling to put it into this nice dictionary format. So you might consider putting it in a pandas data frame okay, and then sort of splicing that in by using a loop. Okay. And so there are probably ways to leverage, the, there are ways, not probably, there are ways to leverage things we've already done in our text cleanup area um, if you knew what entities you wanted to tag. So one of the assumptions here for training your own system is that you know what entities you're interested in finding in a text. All right, from there, we will add all the labels. Okay, I did this manually in the next section, our dependency parsing section, we'll go over how to add these systematically based on what's already in the data. But manually, you do NLP, this is our blank model training, dot entity, because we're doing entities, dot add label, then you tell it what all the labels are. Person and tech are the two it's looking for. Okay. From there, we'll begin training. Okay. So nlp.begin training and import random. Random just helps randomize the data set. <clears throat> now, the training is not usually separated into training and testing data. Um, this is similar. It, I mean, it is a deep learning system that's already pre built for you. You're just feeding it data and letting it do its thing. And so what you'll do 
is you tend to show it the same data multiple times. And so we're gonna shuffle the training data, which at the moment is only two objects, which is not very good training data, but you get the idea here. Um, so we'll shuffle that training data and show it to the model 20 times. And you see the thing you like, it should only take two tries for it to learn it. Well, you'd be surprised. <laughs> also, we'll look at in the next lecture, how to tell how many training um, epochs or rounds you need. So we're kind of building slowly here, but we'll talk about loss and how to see the model training as you go in the dependency parsing section. And so basically what you do is you shuffle your training data, okay? and then we loop over the training data. So for each text and its annotations, the annotations here are only entities. Okay, we could also add parts of speech so you can train multiple pipelines at once. You're gonna say update. Here's the text, here's the annotations and learn the things. Okay, so you loop over that several times. At the moment, we're not checking how it's learning. We're just letting it do its thing. And then you would test on some new piece of information. Okay. But you could test on data you've already seen. So you notice that we didn't do any um, test training split. First of all, we don't really have the data for that. Um, but you could do, you could split the data, but a lot of like deep learning systems from what I've seen people do is um, much of the, the testing and training data overlaps because uh, the way these systems learn, you show it kind of everything and then you test it again to make sure it still remembers it. So you can actually save this model for later. This is very handy if you are um, training in batches. Okay, so NLP to disk. You can also load that model back up from disk. Now let's try one more, let's try uh, a new one. So NLP, it's, we're using our trained model on a new piece of text. Okay. This new piece of text has that person's name and it also has Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch. I want it to be Elasticsearch, but it's Elasticsearch. <laughs> I don't know why. Maybe Elastigirl, maybe this little, little movie inference here. Um, either way. So it's got both of them in it. And let's say, okay, for each entity, print the label, so the label it gave it, and the text. And very interestingly, now if you run this again, you might get a different answer because it will train the model differently each time. If you give it enough training and enough data, it'll settle. And we'll talk about how you can tell when the model is settled so you don't overtrain a model in the, the dependency parsing, sec the parsing section. But right now, what we see is that it has tried to, um, you know, these models don't just learn the one thing. What they're trying to learn is the patterns. And so it's trying to extend this pattern that it was taught to a new pattern that's similar. Unfortunately, if you're looking here, that pattern might be literally the number of like com the combination of characters, right? So that's the same for space, I can't count, number of characters, right? And so it's missed the, the tech component piece, but it's trying to extend to something that's very similar, but that is definitely not a person. And so this is one way you can tell, just this example, that it is not a simple lookup system. So we're training it maybe potentially by looking up a list of things that we're really interested in, but it will extend to new things with large data sets, that might be good. With this very small data set, it is uh, obviously not very good. Okay. So in summary, we've explored the idea about learning meaning using WordNet in our very first week of, of, of semantics here. With WordNet, we found related words. We calculated similarity. We talked about word sense disambiguation to know which word you are talking about. Okay. And then we looked a little bit at named entity recognition. Now this is a huge field um, that has many examples and tons of different model types. And so I, I am giving you this sort of brief overview of what is NER and why might it be interesting. And then just a very brief, like here's how you do this with Spacey. 
but please know that there are, there are graph models, there's all kinds of, um, of stuff that people do here with NER. Okay? Um, but now you know the kinds of words to look for and to search for named entity recognition. And we learned how to set up a pipeline in earlier models of Spacey for building our own custom models. We're going to extend that work next week by looking at depend constituency and dependency parsing, and we'll build our own dependency parser in Spacey as well. All right, so come back next week for parsing. Hi, everyone. A quick update to one of the things I said in this video, which is that this only works for Spacey 2.2.3. I got a new computer. It's really great. However, Spacey 2.2.3 won't install because of an old package called Bliss. After throwing a table and flipping a chair, <laughs> I finally got Spacey 2.3.7, which is the one they ended on before they switched to three to install. All this code still works. So as long as you're using one of the latest versions of Spacey 2, all of the slides that I have shown you previously should still work. And if you get a new computer, you should still be able to install that version because all of the packages dependencies do apparently appear to work on the newest versions of Mac chips, which is the problem. TensorFlow, on the other hand, not working. But good news that this still works in later versions of Spacey. So I just wanted to correct that because um, if you're finding this video later, hopefully it'll still work for you.